professors from Wilfrid Laurier to talk about the Lindsay Shepherd scandal and what happened with Professor Rambucana and Pimlot and Administrator Adria Joel, Adria, right, Adria Joel, who I think is the unsung, what would you call it, the unsung villain in this entire process because she seems to have escaped relatively unscathed, even though I think her role is more reprehensible than anyone else's. Anyways, why don't you guys introduce yourself and talk about what you've been doing at Wilfrid Laurier and also just let everybody know why we're meeting. Yeah, well, uh, I'm Dave Haskell. And uh, I'm a prophet laureate. I'm in the Faculty of Liberal Arts. Uh, this is my colleague, Will. Will, how did we come into this whole thing? Like, this is this didn't just happen with the Lindsay affair. Like, oh. well, to, to, to background, we support maximum freedom of expression. And we've really found each other, uh, along with a few other professors who feel the same way that we do, that free expression and free inquiry is the core value of a university. And But sort of how did we run well, into I'm each in other. business school, uh, so my exposure to the faculty arts is minimal, and I've been really sheltered from this uh, professionally. Uh, but watching what's happening in the U.S., watching what was happening to you at the U of T, I'm a grad, I did my PhD here, and um, it was in January that uh, our uh, university leadership sent out an email um, explaining to the faculty how to think about the Trump travel ban and declaring uh, its, its commitment to diversity, equity, and uh, inclusivity. And I was really offended by that, that they would uh, see fit to pronounce on a political issue in another country. Uh, and offended why? I, I, I got a PhD, I'm able to reach my own conclusions uh, about whether these things are good or bad. Uh, I don't need my administration preaching to me about the, the right way to think about an issue, a political issue particularly. And so, so why do you think they did that? And, and what do you think they were thinking when they did that? Because that sort of seems self-evident, right? It's not the administration's role to dictate a political stance to the faculty. That's just clearly not their role. So what do you think they were thinking? It, would, it seemed like a manifestation of Trump derangement syndrome. It seemed like just the, the same reaction that the, the, the Democrats in the U.S. were having, that they lost to this horrible person and they couldn't understand why and he was so reprehensible and here was yet another terrible thing that he was doing and we must all agree how bad it was well i mean even if the funny thing is even if you can make that case say personally and even socially the idea that you could make that case and then be university administration and then tell your faculty to think that way i mean that's taking it in a whole different that's taking it to a whole whole different level of presumption presumptuousness. Did that come from uh, our administration yes. or from the diversity and equity? No, office? from the administration, from the leadership, the university leadership. Is that right? The CPAN. I remember the, I, it's confusing because I remember we also got uh, an email from the diversity and equity office when, when Trump won and they said that they have created a safe space and they were going to be open for extra hours in case anybody needed to go and find uh, comfort. Right, that happened a lot in the United States, eh? Hey? Yeah. But you'd think at least the Americans have some justification for it, given that it's their country. Well, I mean, I, we need safe spaces because a conservative was elected in the United States, in, 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 not even in our country. It does seem to be a little bit on the absurd side. Well, it just, to me, you know, they didn't send out an email when Justin Trudeau won. Mm -hmm. And I have to imagine that there were some students who were offended. Like, there's got to be conservative students at Laurier. But it's, it's very much a one-sided conversation. When we talk about administration, when we talk about the diversity and equity office, they talk about diversity, but they really don't mean it because they do not want those students who are ideologically diverse. They talk about inclusion, but they purposely will exclude those students. And, and an email like that is proof positive of that kind of exclusion. But didn't so, well, that was that was the thing that just got me hopping mad. And I, I was emailing back and forth with a colleague at Queens, uh, and we were talking about the importance of free speech, and this had outraged me, and uh, and he sent me a, a link to a Star article that David had written, this was now maybe a month later in February or March, about uh, this guest speaker. Uh, oh, Daniel Robitaille. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that she couldn't speak. And was she, was she uh, um, Gomeshi's lawyer? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so merely because she served as a defense lawyer for someone, she was pilloried. Well, this was another, like, when people look at the Lindsay Shepard affair, this is not an isolated case at Wilfrid Laurier. This is something that is 
it is a regular occurrence. And now it isn't always as high profile, but whether it's students in my office saying, I can't speak, whether it's my colleagues sometimes saying to their students, who believes that they're stifled and every hand goes up? And there have been cases of that, colleagues have come and told me. But we've got these other examples, like when Daniel Robitaille came to speak at the Bramford campus of Wilfrid Laurier, and some students agitated until she was forced not to do so. And, and my, my president... Right, we should provide some background. So that was the Gameshi case, right? And so Gameshi was a CBC journalist who was accused of sexual assault and sexual misbehavior by a number of people, who was immediately let go at CBC, right. who was dragged viciously through the press, I would say, and then was um, found innocent in the courts and 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 but and he had a defense lawyer and the defense lawyer had been invited to speak yes she was part of the defense team she was going to speak and she wasn't going to speak about the gomeshi trial in fact she was going to talk about what it's like to be a, a high power powerful lawyer um in in the big city in toronto and i mean that would have been really valuable for the criminology students right. but the students who were agitating against her really with the support of several professors uh, they were saying, well, no, if she comes on, it will trigger students. It will, um, it will mentally harm students. And so that was used as justification for it's the It's interesting, too, to me to see that these claims of harm and so forth are, are generally put forth by people who have no clinical expertise whatsoever. And their idea is that the way that you, first of all, that the way to aid people's mental health is to protect them. And there's no evidence for that whatsoever. And the second is that in your attempts to protect them, the best thing to do is to shelter them from exposure to ideas that would be challenging or frightening, which is precisely the opposite of what a clinician does when he's trying to, or she is trying to um, deal with someone who has excess anxiety. What you do in a case where someone who has excess anxiety, even as a consequence of a trauma, let's say, is you get them to voluntarily expose themselves to increasingly larger doses of exactly what frightens them. That's the curative route. So not only is it um, advice that's being disseminated, say, by people who aren't clinicians, it's actually advice that's being disseminated who are promoting the opposite of what an informed clinician would do. And it isn't, that isn't my opinion. That's, that, that's as close to a consensus as anything you could reach among clinical practitioners, right? One, the rules for clinical improvement is get your story straight, something like that, talk about your past, sort it out and expose yourself to the things that you're afraid of that you're inclined to avoid. That's the pathway to, to resilience and more robust mental health. Okay, so tell us the story a bit. You guys have an inside view of what's happened on the Wilfrid Laurier campus since the, the Lindsay Shepherd affair broke. We, I should just say that, you know, after this Robitaille event, I read uh, David's piece and immediately emailed him and just said, And that's how we, kindred right, soul. right. And uh, we met, and we had lunch, uh, and uh, in, and just talked about the, you know free speech and the Chicago statement, and how can we get it implemented at the university? But we just couldn't see any way forward, and really felt right. So that's another thing we want to discuss. You guys have rewritten the Chicago statement, right. right, so that it's more appropriate in a Canadian context. Right. We call it the Laurier free uh, Laurier statement for freedom of expression. Okay. Okay. And you've been trying to convince or. Or you're trying, been trying, you've been trying to communicate with the university authorities to have that ratified, essentially adopted as a statement of principles. And have you had any success with that? Or no. what's the consequence? They deferred to a task force that's that's uh, going to be held, uh, and we can certainly. Okay, is, and is that in the aftermath of the Shepherd yeah. affair? Is that going well, to be we part didn't of it? Really, do anything over the summer just because it it just seemed. Uh, uh, too big a mountain, uh, and there seemed to be no way to introduce the idea right. of a catalyst for it. And now you've got your catalyst. And Lindsay Shepard becomes the catalyst. Right. And, oh my goodness. And, and, you know, what, what uh, object lesson in what goes on at Laurier, but also what an object lesson in how you handle these free speech opponents. Uh, she's really given a model that other students, I hope, will follow. But it was, it was through this Robitaille thing that we got to know each other and, and a few others. And yeah, there's a couple more of you. That's right. And, yeah. and, and so about five, I think you told me. That's right. So, so the Robitaille inc incident really brought us out of the woodwork. We started to chat and say, you know, we see this problem on our university. We don't know what to do. And then when the Lindsay Shepherd scandal broke, uh, we all immediately were emailing us. It's happened again is essentially what we were saying. 
We said, we've got to do something about this. Uh, I'd already, the, I was out uh, on, a, on a trip and I came home and I said to my wife, where are the newspapers? This was uh, November 12th when the story broke, Christy Blatchford's story. And I said, hey, honey, where are the newspapers? She said, I can't let you see them. I said, why not? She said, you cannot read the papers. And of course, it was because Christy Blatchford's article was in there. So as soon as I read it, I, I was beside myself. I thought, it's happened again. And this time, this is really terrible. They've attacked a TA is what they've done. So I contacted with the full force of the administration yeah. right. and, and and claims that she had done mental harm. Yeah, right. broken two laws, broken two, two laws, laws I mean, federal and provincial. I was sincerely worried that they were going to railroad this young lady. So I oh, they could have easily taken her to the Ontario Human Rights Commission. No, they would have had a field what was going to happen. Uh, I contacted Christy Blatchford. I said, can you put me in touch with her? She was kind enough to do so. I got in touch with Lindsay and I said, I know that this is a terrible time, but you've got a professor who supports you. I knew that these gentlemen also would. Uh, and then quickly, I, as quickly as I could, I wrote uh, an op-ed for the Toronto Star that week, just again saying, this is happening. The world needs to be aware of it. But it was really after that, uh, that Monday, after the story broke on the Saturday, we started to talk. And, and how, can we, how can we assist Lindsay? And, and how can we... Well, the op-ed helped. And, you, and, and the fact that the star ran it was quite remarkable as well. And, and so you, hooray to the star. The star really does want to do its best to champion free expression. Yeah, well, you'd think journalists would actually be concerned about that you to some degree. So. Well, and I think they are. Like, one of the things that's happened to me in the last year is that, although the press coverage of what I did, and just to remind people, so last year I made a video about Bill C-16, which was the bill whose provisions Lindsay Shepard theoretically um, transgressed against, yeah. just to be clear about that. And when I first made the video, I was accused by all sorts of people, including journalists, of, um, well, first of all, making unnecessary noise and being unnecessarily alarmist, which were the minor accusations. And then the more major accusations were that, you know, I was all the things that you'd expect a far right um, uh, agitator to be, a bigot and a transphobe and a racist and all of these things. And so, but what, what was interesting was that the journalists by and large, especially the main journalists, turned around on that issue really quickly. It was probably within three weeks, because what happened was a couple of them actually went and read the policy documents that I had referred to on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website, which are still there and which are still appalling and have led exactly to this situation with Lindsay. And as soon as they read what I had uh, been uh, uh, what, what outing, let's say, in my video, then they started to understand that this what, that I wasn't just ringing a bell for no reason at all. It was actually reasonable, I think, of people to go after me to begin with, because Canada is such a safe and peaceful place, and our political situation and economic situation has been so stable that when someone comes out and says, look, we're in danger of making a major error, the logical first response should be, no, there's something wrong with you. It's like, we're fine, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Well, and, and, and so it, it's reasonable. I think it was reasonable for me to be hit hard in the aftermath of doing that. Because, well, I, generally speaking, whistleblowers in Canada or alarmists in Canada have very little to be alarmist about. Right. But this, this, okay, so now, so fine. So this thing happened with Lindsay. What, what have you seen happening on the Wilfrid Laurier campus? Well, uh, things that I'm not particularly proud of. I, I would say, I mean, I knew that uh, Will and some other colleagues were going to come to the aid of Lindsay, but I was thinking that once her recording became public, that we would just have a flood of professors coming to support our cause, which is we had a, a Laurier statement for freedom of expression modeled on the Chicago statement. We thought that immediately people would just say, of course, we need to reinforce that this needs to be the primary mission. Free expression, free inquiry needs to be the primary mission. And we but got that out pretty fast. We right? really did. In about Ooh, 10 yeah, days, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and got it on change.org, and then we're, I was emailing everybody that I knew and trying to get people interested. And I would say out of 50 emails I sent, I got 15 signatures from personal uh, relationships. Hmm. So even with personal relationships, you could only get a 30% hit rate. So what do you think's stopping professors from signing that, say, or clambering on board, especially in the aftermath of the Shepard recording, which we should point out, you know, this is one of the things that's very interesting, is that outside Wilfrid Laurier and perhaps outside universities that are in the same boat, the reaction to that recording 
was universal, right? And, and national and international and uniform. And the reaction was, what the hell? This is scandalous. There's nothing about this that is acceptable, right? And so what's what struck me as so remarkable is that even though there's been international outrage over this and, and very, and, and not, and, and an in, outrage of a sort that's only been disputed by a very small number of people, at least to begin with, Wilfrid Laurier responded en masse, let's say, as if this was somehow debatable, you know, as if there were two sides of the story here, let's say. And I thought, well, I thought Rambucana and Pimlot, who were the professors, did what they did, I thought, was appalling for in upbraiding her and in the manner in which they did it and in the language that they used. But I thought what was truly terrifying was the presence of Adria Joel at that inquisition, because she was an administrator who was hired specifically to do exactly what she was doing by legislated necessity on the part of the Ontario Liberal government, right? Because it wasn't just the university that was involved in this. Her position was set up because of legislative necessity, which is something also to keep in mind when we're going after the universities. Okay, so you had a hard time getting faculty on board. How many faculty members did sign it? 59? Yeah. Out, of, out of how many 550? faculty? 550 full-time. And now, and so you say, well, well, what, well, what's going on with them? Well, I think that some maybe... I know this is hard to believe, but maybe unaware, even now. Uh, I think there's a big proportion that are unaware. I, I, it's I, unbelievable as that is. I think that... Okay, unaware. well, that's its own mystery, because I don't, I, I don't know where you'd have to have been in the last month to well, not have noticed that this has happened. That people, perhaps in the sciences, the computer yeah. sciences, the math, they, they've got their head down and they're, they're yeah. doing their research. Yeah, 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 and, and, so, and so I don't think there's anything diabolical there. I think that but what we... But business as well, we, I've got very few signatures from the, the business faculty. I mean, some, but uh, a lot of people just aren't engaged. It, it's a bit of a commuter school, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think people are just getting on with their research and their teaching, maybe not aware of the problem. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting thing in and of itself, because I think part of what's led to the occupation of the university, let's say, by the radical postmodern types, is the proclivity of the scientists in particular, but also, I would say, the more serious scholars to be focusing narrowly on their field of inquiry, which is essentially what they should be doing, and not paying attention to any of the broader contextual issues, which is actually a perfectly fine strategy when things are going well, but a terrible strategy when they're not. And what you also see, so we've got these people who might not be aware, and we've got the, the few who are aware and are supporting maximum free expression. But then you've got these other people who are convinced that maximum free expression, free inquiry, is not a good thing for a university. And, and those people are definitely congregated within the arts and the humanities. And they justify it because they are applying a social justice lens or what they would call a critical theory lens right. to this entire, uh, this entire issue. And, and how, how about a quick summary of critical theory? Well, critical theory, I mean, in a nutshell, it's an idea that came from the Frankfurt School in Germany. It transfers over to Columbia University. Uh, it is some German scholars who are Marxists. And what they are saying is that uh, Marxism as an economic unit or as an economic philosophy really doesn't work. It doesn't transfer very well. But let's change it over to a social theory. And it's a, it's a theory of oppressor and oppressed. And it's very bifurcated. You've, you are either one or the other, and if you are the oppressed, you're good, mm -hmm. and if you're the oppressor, you're bad, and it's as simple as that. There's no nuance. Or, okay, I'm, I'm being as bad as they are, to, to, so I'm giving you the really broad strokes on this. But essentially, it does set up the villain and the victim, and, and it is the idea that we must do everything to silence the villain, the oppressor, and, and to center the to the oppressed. Yes, and then we will elevate the oppressed. Right. And the same we, thing happened essentially with the French uh, deconstructionists yes. in the 1970s. It is. So this is this is the motivation behind it. So, yeah. But when when you hear um, them talk about critical theory, it is not critical thinking. There's right. a big difference. And and so parents will hear, well, they're teaching critical theory. Isn't that a good thing? No, because critical thinking means I'm going to show you both sides of this argument. Critical theory means I'm going to deliberately give you one side of the argument. I'm going to tell you who's right, and I'm going to tell you who's wrong. There's an oppressor and an oppressed. The oppressor is the bad guy. The oppressed is the good guy. And it's a very manipulative way of thinking. Okay, so, uh, so, so there's, let's say, 
two reasons why people wouldn't sign the 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 uh, the petition. One is they're doing something else and, and they're just not interested right. in it. And, and, and fair enough, even though I think that that's dangerous at the moment. The second is that they're actually philosophically or ideologically opposed to the propositions. Right. And so to what degree do you think the latter is the determining factor behind the relatively small degree of support that you that you guys have been able to that's drum up? That's a big thing. The, the, uh, a group of faculty signed an open letter uh, to the university complaining about the violence yep. uh, and, and that, the, that the administration need to make the campus safe. Safe, yeah, they did the same thing with me after I, I made my video. I, was, I made the campus unsafe and 200 people signed a, signed a petition. What does unsafe mean? I mean, this is the problem. The, the, the left, the far left, are taking words that have a traditional meaning, a traditional definition, and they're blowing that definition completely completely away and and at one time harm meant that there was an infliction of damage that would have lasting effect and it would compromise the appearance or the function right we, we can think about damage to a car right lasting and it's affecting the, the appearance or the function that's what harm is but they stretch that definition so that it becomes meaningless that my uh, an objectionable idea becomes harm uh, that that when you show a video, you've made a place unsafe, and that yeah, that's the language of trigger warnings and safe space. But but, the, but it's disingenuous. The, the, there was a, a trans rally, and one of the speakers said that letting I can quote this properly: letting Peterson's views be heard in the classroom is violence. Mm -hmm. It is violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. You don't, 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 certainly, violence. yes, There's you can react with violence. Yes, well, that's often what I think that I've thought a lot about. One of the tenets of postmodernism, uh, less so I would say of critical theory, but particularly of postmodernism and its more Marxist variants, is that the only motivation for the construction of hierarchies is power. And you think, well, that's no. There's lots of reasons for producing hierarchies, right? There's hierarchies of competence, there's hierarchies of interest, there's hier hierarchies of aesthetic quality. Like, there's all sorts of, wherever you can make a qualitative judgment, you make a hierarchy. So there's the idea that power is the only driving force between behind the construction of hierarchies is absolutely preposterous. So you think, well, why in the world would anyone make that claim that it's only power that exists? Well, as far as I can tell, at least one of the reasons is that it justifies the use of power. Now, if you have your position because of power, which is basically tyranny, then I'm fully warranted in my use of power against you. That's all there is. So I think it's a great justification for it. I just want to interject here before the video gets too long. Um, to me, this topic needs to be reopened again. Um, I'm thinking what Peterson and uh, his two colleagues here are talking about is very important for the public to know and to share and propagate because when they're talking about it's a very dangerous issue, you see, because their lives, their 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 livelihood is on the line. Their jobs are on the line. I would say, unless they're a tenured professor, professor, and even if they were, they can be fired on 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 such grounds as as uh, Lindsay Shepard was. Though the publicity for firing Jordan Peterson would be extremely great. Um. So. I just wanted to say, because I can't really say it better than, than Jordan Peterson would or his two colleagues, but I'll, I'll say this. When you're dealing with education as it exists today, the ideas that they express in this video run contradictory to the official narrative that they teach you in education and they require you to act out in at, well as a teacher as a professor and so on um, so th there's a few things that I want to comment on one was was the fact that uh, they were talking about creating safe spaces when Trump was elected for 
students that had either emotional or psychological trauma due to, to the, the Trump victory. Um, so that, that was, to me, extremely ridiculous. Um, and then the there was a task force appointed when these two professors came forward with a petition uh, to bring freedom of speech into the values and ideals of that university. So there, there was a task force, like uh, some, some official authority already put there to stonewall their intentions. And they, they refer to it in this video as a mountain too great to climb, more or less. Like it, they, they were against somebody who, whom, you know, essentially it, it, it was nearly an impossible task. And to pursue it might have been quite ridiculous and quite expensive and many other reasons which they cite. that They, they refused to climb the mountain, so to speak. Um, What I want to say about it is that I agree with the statement that the arts and humanities are propagating that um, social justice lens, as they put. Um, this kind of thinking is extremely dangerous due to the fact that it is intolerant to other viewpoints, no matter what, even if it's a rational viewpoint. They'll still reject it if it's not part of the official narrative. And that was the whole idea of uh, oppressor versus oppressed. It is uh, the same thing. Uh, the, the idea to create the safe spaces is to alienate any ideas that are not a part of the official narrative, which is um, essentially what they discussed here. Uh, so, you know, when Lindsay Shepard brought that, uh, that Jordan Peterson video in, she was, <laughs> according to, to the professors who were accusing her uh, in violation of a human rights act that exists in the in the uh, in the code so I'm not going to get into that but what I what I want to, to express is that the left is that that wording especially that wording is very dangerous they're taking words out of context uh, harm and so on and and uh, trying to attach these words to anything that threatens their power and as Jordan Peterson put there the end goal actually is power to justify power and 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 to take power so I will make a second video because uh, I felt that uh, you know it's it was important for me to break down and analyze this uh, dialogue. And so the, we're only about a quarter of the way through the entire speech, which is two hours. I won't go through it all, but um, I can only say that uh, this topic is, is very, very important. And the public should know it. There's a, a very dangerous element that goes on in the schools, which is an indoctrination of the students. But also, um, if you happen to be a conservative uh, or you have an idea contrary to the views of the university, they will come down hard on you and they will alienate you. It is pleasing to me to see those two professors that are trying to fight for the rights of their students to have the, the freedom of thought. Uh, so I applaud them for the effort and I will continue this, uh, this discussion in the second video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.